Susan Deercloud is a poet who grew up in the Catskill Mountains, and she comes back to us today from those same mountains. She is of Catskill Native American lineage, and as a child growing up, recalls that she loved having her parents read to her every day and tell her many stories and love stories so much that when they would sing stories in the car as a family driving through the mountains, taking a long drive, and the songs would stop, Susan would often gift the family with continuation of songs that were stories that just popped into her mind. And she would continue with storytelling as well as singing to her family. And Susan remarked that writing for her is still like that, where there is a flash to her in her mind with a kaleidoscope of many images and similes and metaphors, sounds and silences. And uh, she also noted that it's the great hand that helps with the turning the kaleidoscope on all of this to shapeshift into a poem. Susan has received many awards and fellowships for her creative writing. She's taught writing at conferences, and she has been an editor, and she has taught at the college level. She has edited over three published anthologies and been an advisor to Yellow Medicine Journal of Indigenous Literature, Art, and Thought, and a board member for You Are Not Alone, nonprofit Native organization to prevent suicide among Native American young people, and also serves on an international organization for peace. Her work is published in many journals and anthologies, and she has a number of her published collections as well. Susan said, in conclusion, sharing st poetry and stories brings pe human beings into community with each other. She said, the people of indigenous tribes believe that our words remain in the place where we speak them. When we speak, our breath intermingles with all other breaths and the rest of the sacred web of the life. We say we are responsible to the next seven generations to come, so I try to use words in responsible ways that bear witness to some of the tragedies of life, but also tie in with the affirmation, celebration, and transformation of life as well. And uh, I look forward to uh, perhaps a book someday with uh, some of these wonderful thoughts of, on writing and life. And right now, I look forward to hearing Susan Deercloud come up and share her poetry. Please help me give her a warm, welcoming hand. Susan Deercloud. Thank you, Cheryl, for that um, eloquent uh, introduction that, that wisdom introduction. And thank you, everybody, for being here, for your dream catcher faces that are so luminous. They match this beautiful October day. I always start with this poem. Uh, it's called Marlon Brando Dies at 80. I read it because it reflects, to me, how people help each other out uh, in, the, in, in the sense that we're all interconnected. And it's important to do that. Marlon Brando dies at 80. It blasts me when I open AOL Instant Messenger, which flashes current news before I pop up my buddy list. Right now, I wish I could I am you, Marlon. Thank you for hating Hollywood and for bugging America's low-carb liberals by getting fat on Big Macs after you buttered that actress in Last Tango in Paris with the real thing. No, I can't believe it's not butter for you. And conservative Indian haters, closet and otherwise, by sending Sasheen Littlefeather to 1973 Academy Awards, black-haired Apache princess refusing Oscar for you. And thanks for kissing Larry King on the lips, for playing the trickster. 
In the article, Marlin, they refer to your brutal male beauty. I know what they mean. I have watched a streetcar named Desire more times than I can count on my 10 little Indian fingers that yearn to hold your naked body hot to the campfire of my nakedness, even after you got anti-beautiful people fat. Marlon, I loved you. Up there on the big screen, I wanted to suck that sultry scowl of mouth on the verge of kiss from the time I was a girl. You made me feel like a woman even then. Marlon Brando dies at 80. My brother, you will never die. Once a sister and I got into a discussion about you and Mel Gibson. When other women were wearing their polyester thongs over Aussie man. Macho Mel, buff, blue-eyed. All the women had seen him in Braveheart, imagining him fundamental beneath his kilts. The sister said, I would still take Brando fat over Mel Skinny any day. I said, so would I. And we laughed, ecstatic. Brutal, those critics don't get what we talked about. Marlon, we knew your real beauty. Something deep down, crying, tender, and so sensitive, crazy, that no old age or obesity or people's stupidity could rob it from you. Marlin, they can say you died, but you are alive in this Indian heart. You are a part of Indian territory because somehow you were of our heartbreak of our love medicine, of our forever crying for a vision, no matter how much the white man stole our land, our language, our traditions, no matter how many children died, how many of us drank ourselves to suicide. We all saw it in your listening eyes, the young, black-haired, broken-nosed man with his glistening warrior's glance. Marlin, I offer you the wild rose sweetness of my desire, the smiles of my people before Columbus came, our hearts that break, yet keep round dancing back into song. Brando, I offer you this poetry. Brother, I send you with blessing and grace into the spirit world where my grandfathers and my grandmothers greet you. I know I'm a short person. Yeah. Proud of it, but short. This is called, uh, this is from a, a book called Fox Mountain. I think of it as my homecoming poems. And um, this poem has to do with uh, being a woman growing older. It's called Last Night. I actually wrote this when I lived in Massachusetts a few years back. Last Night. Last night I dreamed I was back in mountains. I was that girl again. A blue panther shadowed the girl into the meadows. Green butterflies swirled around burgeoning wildflowers. In the grass dance fields, the girl dreamed of a boy who would love her. He'd be the sky-eyed one, bearing 
an armful of clover. Last night, I was back in mountains. I was that girl making love with the boy inside midsummer's sun. His lips kissed the petals of her eyelids, lips, petals, quivering butterfly wings. His body singing became a meadow for the stem of hers. They were all red skin blossom pollinated by solstice. This morning, girl woke 500 miles away. This morning, hair snowed down my arms. Oh, Indian paintbrush boy. So I'm in Pilgrim country, and Thanksgiving is coming up pretty soon, so I thought I'd read you a Thanksgiving poem. It's called Quiet Little Poem. After Thanksgiving and Black Friday, I am waiting for a quiet little poem to surprise me, as sometimes a bird will in the middle of the night, singing the way my Cayuga poet friend does in a different fashion, when he phones three in the morning, wandering Rochester, New York, urban nightmare streets that bloom into a weirdly beautiful dreamscape in the sharing of poems across the dark matters of four seasons. I am waiting for the Godot of a quiet little poem after encountering such a terrible ugliness on Thanksgiving night and then Black Friday. I was reminded once more how the massacres following the first Thanksgiving continue. That black hat hatred towards beauty like this year's first snow, my Cayuga friend shared with me over hundreds of miles of stolen land. I, in my half sleep, listening to his exuberant words, wander with his wet shoes down sidewalks, beginning to be covered by the mercies of crystals and streetlights brilliances numerous as the buried stars, two Indian poets still not vanishing, urban indigenous Odysseus, nightbird words lit unique as snow crystals, me with my long snow of hair, wakened in a bed, in the mountains, in a house belonging to others. Are we near Walden Pond? No, half an hour from Oh, okay, because I wanted to read a, you know, a, a direct Massachusetts poem. And this is called The Only Way to See Walden Pond. Your niece warned Walden Pond isn't the same pond Thoreau wrote about. Few woods around it, crowded with tourists, especially in summer when they swim and pee in the water and kids scream on the beach. But when you visited her and her family on the way home from the Boston Art Museum, her husband swerved off highway so you could make your pilgrimage to the famous pond. Night then, you half asleep between their sleeping son and daughter. Do you want me to stop, he said, so you can walk to the pond? You smiled surprise. No, I prefer seeing the water glimmer through the trees. I'm glad I saw it in this quiet way. A month later, you dreamed yourself back there. You, an Indian woman skinny dipping in Walden Pond in mute moonlight. 
Not even arms flying through amethyst waves made sounds as your long hair played at braids with water. That endless Indian summer fall, you knew no peace such as Thoreau wrote about. Withdrawal and return meant withdrawing from life forever, returning to your mother to become dirt, leaves, moss. You imagined you moved to Massachusetts only to die in Amherst Woods. Walden Pond at night, surprise of kindness. Walden Pond at night, surprise of dream. Glimmer of light through trees, shimmer of skin through water. Hearing Thoreau's last word before he died, Indians. Here's a poem from my mother, my beautiful mother. It's called Asthma. You used to predict the exact date it would begin, always in dog days. Hay fever when ragweed scraped air like brown sentinels dressed to kill. Asthma when goldenrod bloomed into deceptions of breathtaking yellow. Every August, the air you and I could not get enough of cooled into September. One more school year. Every morning, 4 a.m., our throats shut. We'd rise, you'd light the gas oven for heat. We'd hunch near open stove door, wheeze, fight to suck ox oxygen in, stare at flames, wavering bruise-like in black holes. I don't pretend you were a demonstrative mother. Unlike my younger sister, I don't recall your saying you loved me. Only when I couldn't breathe, when I was sickest, did I receive affection. Dawns when sun over trees bloomed outside kitchen window, when even in suffering, our eyes flamed blue at leaves lifting to fire. Maybe then you grabbed my hand, fingers a weave of desperation. And I, in the web, thinking, you, mother, so beautiful, as we suffocate it together. I read two more poems. At this hour, this is a love poem for my beloved. At this hour, at this hour, edging into first morning, the street glimmers even quieter than forest. How free of cricket chirps my third floor, my writing garret, next to it, garret with bed. And although still August, tonight's sunset leafed out in autumn's frayed reds. All of this evokes ancient poems painted by Japanese ladies of the court. I even wear scarlet kimono from Japan, a wayfaring poet friend brought home for me. Soon the haikus of my hands will cease writing, silk cranes flying across thighs. Soon this yearning must lie down where your body felt like wings turning me to sky. I'll end with a birthday dance poem. I'm going to be 63 tomorrow and proud of it. And I like, thank you. You are a part of my birthday celebration. Seriously, that's why I came up here, to be with good poets, beautiful poets, and other people. 
<laughs> other beautiful people. Dances with snow, Fox Mountain. Friends, little did I know, the November night you invited me to Fox Mountain to celebrate my October birthday would be the first snowfall of that year. The food was good as ever, the wine and other drink flowed like the rivers before deepest winter freezes them. And my face still glows from the many candles lit to honor my aging. But best of all was when we spilled out laughing onto the icy deck, snow crystals twinkling in the porch light, and we slipping and sliding around like silly kids. And I don't know how this happened, but I decided to kick off my shoes and start dancing barefooted there in the high mountain night, fox trotting with snow, like stars drifting down, then rising up whitely to meet our sparkling bodies, and me thinking, this must be it. This must be eternity. Well, one of you snapped my picture so I could show the entire world how simple being born is. <laughs> Thank you. You're a wonderful audience. Thank you. We float through air on a globe of scarlet and sunshine yellow far above and away from a world that has no time or inclination for us. We sail over the uncertain fields of pine trees below us before we rise above the clouds and suddenly try to grow accustomed to a surprise burst of intense sunlight. Then we look down on a bright, wondrous landscape of glowing pearly clouds and imagine ourselves as horses galloping on a celestial riding range. Our love carries us away from chaos and uncertainty and into the joy we sought for all our lives. This is all we need. I'm Aspie Chris, thanks very much. was a time for jumping on the moon It was a time for running with the bulls through town And now we are swimming against the tide against the tide over now too soon time spent without cost we will abide we will abide It was a time of aliens in the skies It was a time of all our heroes lost All lost And now we are looking deep inside Deep inside To fly Gravity now pulls us down
hold on to your memories of time pass of time pass your memories are what's left you when your time has passed it was a time for jumping on the moon Thank you. You force me to pull down the locked box hiding in the far left corner on the top shelf of my closet. I choke dust as I lift the lid, smell the must of old loves, hard memories, grievous secrets. Nobody wants to see these. Certainly not me, but here we are. Your words intend love, but they are often sharp, full of your passion to do better, live rightly. True to yourself and ever true to me, you peel the skin of my heart like a grape, cutting through rib, sinew, muscle, until the pump is exposed, stutter beating to the insult of your voice. I cannot shout you away cannot refute your claims. Whatever rises in me to clatter against my frame roars inwardly and sinks deeply, silently into the marrow of my bones. Thank you.